Hello and welcome to the Best Practices Summit. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots 501c3 nonprofit that protects the natural world through the conservation of pollinators. Our co host is the Xerxes Society, a science based nonprofit. Okay. Well, hello everyone. My name is Christine Nemec. I'm a program manager at the University of Northern Iowa Tallgrass Prairie Center. Today, I'm going to talk about the Iowa approach to managing our roadside vegetation. Iowa is pretty unique. We're the only state that I'm aware of where we have the financial and logistical support to manage our roadsides in an ecological integrated manner. I'm just not aware of any other state that has that support. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> how that came about in this presentation and how we manage our, our roadsides. So we'll need to go back to the 80s to understand how this all began. At that time, the DOT and counties, like many areas, were in the habit of blanket spraying weeds with herbicides in the roadsides. Then just go along and try to address the most problematic weeds. They would just blanket spray everything. Uh, the public was getting more concerned about groundwater quality. So in 1987, the state legislature passed the Groundwater Protection Act. And also during this time frame, there were some people who were getting more and more concerned about the loss of prairie in the state. One of those people was Bill Haywood. He was a county conservationist and he was traveling across the state, encouraging people to start restoring prairie, especially in the roadsides, because that was one of the, the areas that was available because it's public land. So he was pretty instrumental. He's just this charismatic guy who went around trying to encourage people to plant prairie. So those were kind of two factors that started to get more interest in Iowa about, okay, maybe roadsides are a good place where some prairie plants would be helpful for improving water quality. And to illustrate how important roadsides are as far as public land, in Iowa, roadsides are 60% of the public land followed by Iowa Department of Natural Resources land, Iowa County Conservation land that's in parks within counties, and federal public lands. So that's both the federal, state, and county roadsides. That's all 60% of all the public land in Iowa. And of that, around 70% is in within county roadsides. So from this map, you can show how densely how densely populated the, the roadsides are within Iowa. This is all the county roadsides. That's a tremendous amount of land within Iowa. We have one of the most dense roadside networks in the state as far as county or secondary roads. In 1988, the Iowa State Legislature passed the Integrated Roadside Vegetation Management Legislation, also known as IRVM. And it said it was declared to be in the general public welfare and a highway purpose for the vegetation of Iowa's roadsides to be preserved, planted, and maintained to be safe, visually interesting, ecologically integrated, and useful for many purposes. So you can see the, the roadsides were intended to be managed for many purposes, not just habitat. It's to improve water quality, water movement, improve erosion, beautify the roadsides. So it's a really holistic type of environmental legislation when it comes to roadsides. Around the same time, the legislature also created the Living Roadway Trust Fund. This is funded from three sources. One is REAP funds, which is the Resource Enhancement and Protection Act. So gaming receipts, license plate sales go into this pot of money. There's a tax on utility easements and a road use tax fund. Each year, there's roughly around $800 to $860,000 in this pot of money that's available. There's a formula to allocate the pot of money among state, counties, and cities for their activities that go in support of IRVM integrated roadside kind of activities. The legislation also created a couple of key positions. One is the Living Roadway Trust Fund coordinator position, which is housed at the Iowa DOT. And in this picture, our current LRTF coordinator is Tara Van Wass. She's on the far right. And to her left is Cody Unstead. He is the LRTF assistant. So he assists Tara with quite a bit of things. And then Shauna Godbold is their supervisor. She's the 
the landscape architect, the chief landscape architect within their office at the Iowa DOT. So the coordinator administers LRTF grants. So people have to apply for grants to get the LRTF funds. Maintains the LRTF Technical Advisory Committee, which is a, a committee of, from various sectors. That's the electricity sector, cities, roadside managers. They help review the grants and talk about issues related to roadsides a couple times a year. We meet you know, about twice a year. I've been on that committee since 2018. She creates and implements requirements for IRVM plans. Entities like cities and counties have to have an IRVM plan on file if they're gonna apply for grants. So the plans talk about how they approach roadside management. How are they implementing it? So we know that they've put some thought into how they're managing their roadsides. And the coordinator also creates public outreach materials such as posters and publications. So you can see on the, this table, this is a, a table at one of the conferences, they have all sorts of beautiful posters and pamphlets, educational pamphlets about native plants. So that's one of their roles is to create educational publications. The legislation also created my position. So I'm the statewide coordinator. I'm housed at the UNI Tallgrass Prairie Center. In my role, each year I get a grant through the Federal Highways Administration through the Transportation Alternatives Program, where I purchase native seed mixes to provide to the counties and cities who request it, but it's mostly counties. So it's free to them. They just have to provide the labor and the equipment to plant the seed. They have to document where they're planting it and turn that in. I organize an annual fall conference, which is in September of each year, and a winter meeting for roadside managers, which is in Ames. It's actually tomorrow. It's usually the first or second Wednesday in March. So that helps facilitate networking and education for roadside vegetation managers across the state. I maintain communication, such as a monthly e-newsletter, social media, recruit new counties, orient new roadside managers, and conduct public outreach. So IRVM is voluntary at the county level. Counties do not have to practice it. Around half of Iowa's counties have chosen to hire a roadside manager, do an IRVM plan, get involved with managing using the IRVM approach. So in summary, here's the main resources we have to support county roadside vegetation programs in Iowa. One's the, the Federal Highways Grant, as I mentioned, to get high quality seed. We have the LRTF grants to get different types of equipment. Here you can see a hydro seeder. You can also fund other activities like a, a roadside inventory. That's pretty important for new programs. We like to see them do a, a detailed roadside inventory in the entire state or the entire county. It's, it's kind of like a windshield survey where we have a botanist go along and they document roughly what's in the roadsides, any problem areas, any patches of native remnant vegetation. So that's important for new counties. And we also have the Tallgrass Prairie Center. You know, why am I not housed at the DOT? Well, it's because in the 80s, at the time all this was getting going, there was a key professor at UNI named Daryl Smith. He's retired now, but he was a big supporter of getting native plants in the roadsides. And it made sense to have my position housed here at the Tallgrass Prairie Center because he was so, so involved with all of this. And actually the Tallgrass Prairie Center was originally called the Native Roadside Vegetation Center. And there's even some signs on campus that still say that because that's why it was founded in the first place to support this effort to get natives and roadsides. And there's a lot of tall grass prairie expertise here at the center. So it's been a really good place for this position to be housed and it, help, it helps complement the resources at the DOT. So I'll talk a little bit about the grant I get for counties. Each year I offer them two mixes. One is the clean out mix of around nine grass and sedge species, 19 wildflower species. The other is a bit higher diversity mix, around 12 grass and sedge species, 36 wildflower species. We offer two mixes because the clean out refers to ditches that tend to get a lot of runoff from the adjacent land. So they tend to get silted in. They have to go in and clean it out again. So that's why it's called the clean out. So we don't want to spend as much money on areas that are in danger of having to be disturbed again which happens sometimes, depending on where the, the ditch is located. 
And then the diversity mixes for areas that are less likely to be disturbed. So we're willing to invest more in those. When I put this data out for bid, I put in a preference for yellow tag, which is basically local ecotype seed. So if a county is off, or not a county, a seed producer, so this is open to any seed producer, they're welcome to bid on this every year. If they provide the source identified seed, that's the preference, but if they, if they offer something that's not within the preferred area, well, then I tack 15% onto that cost when I'm considering whether I'm gonna buy it. If it's in a state other than Iowa, well, I add 20% to the cost. So there's kind of like a little bit of a penalty just to, to prefer the local ecotype seed. And if it's uncertified, it has zero preference. And I don't do any cultivated varieties or grasses or forbs. No grasses or forbs have been treated with neonicotinoids. So this, this is in the guidelines they get in the bid. Roughly 85 to 90% of the seed I buy ends up being local ecotype because of these, these preferences I build into the bid. We prefer that because it's adapted to, to Iowa. That's what we want. We want the best success we can get in the roadsides. It's a challenging environment, so we want the, the best local ecotype seed we can get. We think of it as a good investment. People are sometimes curious, so what are the seeding rates? Maybe compared to level land. Well, this is what the seeding rates we found works really well. And roadsides, it, it varies a little bit depending on the slope. Because some areas of the roadside might be more level, so you don't need as, as much. So you can see there's a heavy emphasis on native grasses because of the, the erosion factor. One of the big reasons counties like to see the natives is to get that erosion control benefit. And all of this is in a technical manual that's part of the resources I provided for this conference. It's the IRVM technical manual. So it gives all the details about exactly how we go about planting, when do we plant, what's the seeding rates, all that sort of thing is in that technical manual if you wanna learn more. The big four prairie grasses are a big component of the seed mixes to help reduce erosion and they provide beauty, especially in the fall. We include a variety of nectar plants that bloom all across the season. That's important. And the public just said, oh, they're beautiful. But of course, from the biologist type of, from our viewpoint, we try to get some that have a lot of value for pollinators, like the bee balm, rattlesnake master, purple prairie clover. Those are pretty important. The main seeding methods that the county roadside managers use are hydro seeding on the left. This is a winter hydro seeding. That's just a lot easier on steep roadsides. And then to a smaller extent, drill seeding. They also prefer hydro seeding because they don't have to go through a cultural resources review. If there's going to be drilling or disturbance of the roadside, we have to have it reviewed for cultural resources like burial sites. So it's a little bit more of an involved process. So logistically, it's just easier to hydro seed. I mentioned it's voluntary to do IRVM at the county level. So I always like to show this map so you can picture what it looks like across the state. The counties in green have a roadside vegetation manager. So this is someone usually with a biological background who knows their plants well. They know how to plant, know how to spray ecologically. So this is someone aside from the engineering staff who's, that's their only job or their main job in the county is to manage the roadside vegetation in an ecological integrated way. The ones at the little plant in the bottom right have an IRVM plan on file with the Iowa DOT. And the number says how many years since 2000 or since 1998 that they've requested seed. So you see some have been really active getting seed pretty much every year, others are not that active. But there seems to be a social effect. Neighbors are more likely to have a program. It just, it just kind of spreads, I think. It's like a social impact about who decides to have a program depending on what their neighbors are doing. I'll just briefly go over a few surveys we've done uh, just to get the public's input about what they think about roadside vegetation. Here's one survey a contractor did called Mindfire Communications. This was done in 2016. They surveyed Iowans, environmental stakeholders in Iowa, and Iowa legislators. So it's a big report. I'll just go over a couple things. One was they showed pictures 
the different kinds of roadside vegetation and ask them, what do you think? Which, which of these three looks do you prefer? So you have the managed roadside prey plantings on the top left. So these are kind of our, our native prey plantings we put out there, just mowed in the middle and then mowing periodically, but not really managing for diversity, not planting. So you get some tall weedy plants, kind of monocultures of weedy tall plants. So which do they prefer? They also divided the public into three categories, like the country dwellers or commuters or city people. But across the public, uh, roughly half actually did like the prairie plantings. Around 25% wanted the plain mode look and around 25% on average preferred mode with some of the taller plants. The recommendations, and they recommended what messages resonate most. It appeared there's two key messages across all three of these audiences. One is pollinator habitat conservation and restoration that does resonate with all three. And water quality management is really big here, especially to the public, to Iowans. So if we can demonstrate how these native plants help water quality, that can be a, a key selling point. But be careful about politically charged wording as far as the water quality being tied to field runoff. That's important in the messaging. So again, here's the, the key messages kind of in brief. If native plant restoration for Iowa's roadsides, why it matters. Ayurvam, the, key, the term Ayurvam does not resonate. Not surprisingly, that's not, it's a very technical word. So they liked native plant restoration. If you're talking about roadsides, you talk about native plant restoration. So if we do that, supporting pollinators, improving water quality, like we mentioned, and also improving Iowa for future generations. They said, if use this kind of language when you're messaging to Iowans, talk about the future investment. So these are just kind of the exact words they'd like to see us use in our messaging. Another survey I did was in 2016. So I came into my position in 2015. And one of the first things I wanted to do was understand my audience. I just want to go out there talking about how great this is because I realized it's really important to understand who you're talking to and meet them where they're at. So I coordinated with the social scientists here at UNI and they helped me create an online survey that also went out by mail. We surveyed the engineers and the roadside managers in those counties that have a roadside manager to learn how they, how they implement roadside vegetation management and also what, what do they think about it. So to summarize, here's some of the key behaviors we were interested in. One was how they maintain their plantings. How often do they burn? Who burns? How often do they mow? Just as an example of a couple of practices. Spot spraying herbicides. Are there still any counties that do blanket spraying? Are they just doing this targeted approach at the most important prioritized weeds? Are there any counties that preserve roadside prey remnants? Because there are some remnants. Some of these roadside inventories have revealed a, a surprising number of really good quality remnants, more than I expected. Maybe less than 5% of the roadside vegetation, but there's still some really nice sites out there. And how do they evaluate the success of the plantings? I'm just going to reveal a couple of findings. So we're not going through all these graphs. There's a lot of information in this report if you want more detail. So one of the statements we asked, well, what do you think are the benefits of having this in your county? We compared the road same manager and the engineer. So the dark blue is strongly agree with the benefit. The lighter blue is agree. And then the dark green is disagree. And then there's don't know. So the main emphasis, I think, is the, the strongly agree and agree. So focus on the dark blue, light blue when you're looking at this. So not surprisingly, or the dark green, light green. Oops. So not surprisingly, the, the roadside managers had a lot stronger opinions. They really saw the benefits of all this. Both of them, though, thought that roadsides provided attractive, or the, the native plants make the roadsides more attractive. That was really important. They thought it maintains and improves water quality. 
enhances biodiversity, protects soil resources, promotes partnerships. The next greatest benefits reduce spread of invasive species, optimizes the effectiveness of weed and pest control practices, reduce blowing snow. And that's an important safety benefit too. We try to emphasize safety. And if the public has to deal with less blowing snow, that's important. There's been a little bit of evidence that if you reduce blowing snow, that can also improve the, the lifespan of the pavement. So I think that's something that could be investigated further. It saves money both long and short term and makes roadways safer. We asked them, has it been challenging using native plantings? And so you can see there was some, over half generally thought it was at least somewhat to extremely challenging to use native plantings in the roadsides. So we asked them, what are the challenges? So you'll see both groups said the length of time to establish or the short growing season, that is understandably a challenge. It does take patience. It takes about three years after you plant something along the roadside to, to really see the benefits, to see it looking like prairie. And here's something that was a little surprising, but especially the, the roadside managers who are the ones out there maintaining these plantings said, interference with the native plantings by the adjacent landowners. So that continues to be a challenge, not in all counties. It kind of depends on the culture and the aesthetic preferences in that county. But in some counties, this can be a problem where the adjacent landowner just doesn't like the look. They mow it, they spray it out. Even though it is public property, it's not the landowner's property. Up, up to a certain point within the right-of-way, it is county property. So I provide the county's signs, no mow, no spray signs. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes it makes it worse. They say, oh, it's like a target. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go come spray this. But we just encourage them to keep communicating with the landowner try to explain why they're doing what they're doing. It's not enforced that well, I mean, even though it's a law, the landowner's not supposed to spray, but some counties do send letters or penalize the landowner. They have to pay for the cost of replanting it. But there's some local politics involved. A lot of the, the county folks are landowners themselves and it's not always enforced that well, but that is a challenge that they face. Then other challenges, the cost of the material or agency funding acceptance among contractors or the public's desire. So it's actually kind of low. The public sometimes doesn't, they're not that opposed to the natives. So these results are all in a report. Um, yeah, it just has more details about how often they burn. For example, we found around half the counties do prescribed burns. But at the end, I'll have my contact information. You're welcome to a copy of this report if you want all that detailed information, or if you want to yeah, be able to see the graphs up close for a longer period of time. So another survey I did was 2017. So the engineers are roadside managers. They're the ones responsible for getting the roadside vegetation managed. I also was curious about the county decision makers. So the, the board of supervisors is really important in a county because they decide the funding levels. They decide if the county can afford to hire a roadside manager. They choose the county engineer. They, they have a lot of influence over the county budget. So they're key decision makers and the conservation board directors. So most of the county road state managers work for the engineer. In some counties, around a third, they work for the county conservation board director. So they can be influential in saying, hey, I really want this position in my department. So we we're interested in what they thought. So we asked them, are there any barriers to your county's implementation of IRVM practices? Half of them, throughout the survey, we realized around half of them really weren't that familiar with IRVM or roadside vegetation. So I guess there's a need for more information or education about that. But a lot of the conservation board directors thought there were challenges or barriers compared to the Board of Supervisors in green. So here's some of the barriers they identified. 
lack of elected officials or staff support, lack of staff capacity or support, other concerns just being a higher priority within the county, the cost of starting a program, the lack of community support, insufficient proof of cost savings. So again, these were just asked of those who did thought it was a challenge. We didn't ask this of the people who didn't know. So these are the, the barriers identified by, by the key decision makers. So I think this is really important because we can tout the benefits of this all we want. That's e to me, that's the easier thing to do. But the hard thing to do is, is figure out what the barriers are to actually getting counties to adopt these practices. And how do we overcome these barriers? This is another key question. We asked them, how much impact does each of the following items have on your county's decision about roadside vegetation management? So this is basically the decision makers' priorities when they're deciding if their county should have a program or how well they think it's going. Oops. So you can see maintenance cost savings was really high, soil erosion concerns, snow control, this is all in descending order. Invasive species, public feedback, water quality, the time spent mowing. That was just asked in the mail survey, by the way, that's why there's an asterisk. It was just asked in one version of the survey. And the, all the other questions were asked in both. Consideration of aesthetics, stormwater management, pollinators and other wildlife. So this is important. Out of all the factors that the County Board of Supervisors and the Conservation Board Directors consider when they're deciding how the roadside vegetation should be managed in their county, pollinators is last. And this is, reflects what I've been hearing from the roadside managers. They say, if, if you're talking to a county, encouraging them to get involved, don't spend any or much time on pollinators. And I agree with this. I think it's more efficient to meet them where they're at, talk about their priorities, so talk about the soil erosion, because we're still going to get the same benefit. My seed mixes include flowers that help benefit pollinators, but if they don't care about that, why spend a lot of time on that? If they see the erosion benefits and the aesthetics, which the engineers usually see, the, they're in support of that. Maybe it's a little bit less important to this group. But the seed mixes automatically are going to help pollinators with the, the flowers they include. So I just really try to hit on what's important to them so you can still get the same result. So again, if you're interested in the report from this survey, you're welcome to email me and I can provide that to you. That's on the right. And I also condensed it into a, a manuscript that I submitted for publication, which is published early last year in the journal Environmental Management. So the report was produced by our social scientists. So it was a little bit light on the recommendations or the literature search. So I built on that to do kind of a thorough review of the literature about roadside revegetation. I greatly expand the discussion section to talk about some potential ways forward, about addressing some of these challenges, how, how to help the counties overcome the barriers. And I would say, I guess one of my things is, first of all, just relaying the information to them in the way they want. The county decision makers said they would like to learn about my program through an e-newsletter or at conferences. So during the pandemic, I created a quarterly e-newsletter that goes out to them. So hopefully that's bumping up the awareness and not half of them are saying, I don't know if there's challenges or not. I don't know what's involved. So they've been getting a quarterly e-newsletter, which is what they requested. And as conferences return, I'd like to get back to talking at conferences because it's easy to reach a lot of them there. Another thing, I really like social science. I just think there's a lot of good tips out there about how to do more than just relaying information. Like how do you, how do you find the key people within a county, like the key landowners? Maybe it would be worth getting signs on their land if, if they're willing to host a native planting, have a sign that explains what the planting is. It's going to mean a lot if it's by someone's land who has a lot of social influence within the county, or can we interview them and their profile in the local publication or publications that farmers read. So these are just some ideas going forward. And there's roughly half of the counties that don't have a program, the challenging ones, how do we build more social support? And I think it's leveraging those key connections in the county and trying to build those relationships.
Finally, I just have a couple of resources I would like to mention if you'd like to get more involved in learning about efforts to plant roadsides for habitat. One is the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group. This was formed in 2015 at the University of Illinois Chicago. And originally it was mostly to convene people in the Midwest, state DOTs, electrical utilities, some nonprofits were interested in in the potential of rights of way for habitat. It's greatly expanded. They've done a great job of expanding nationally. So now there's people from all over the country involved in this. Before the pandemic, they're meeting twice a year. And that, they didn't really switch to much virtual. They've done a few virtual webinars. But I would certainly encourage checking out their website, just Google and find out their website, see all the resources on there, see if there's a way you can get on their mailing list, get more involved. They're doing really good work. I'm involved with the strategic planning committee for this group, and we're trying to decide how best to go forward to continue to be a, a good clearinghouse and networking event, but also get some policy recommendations on the, the ground, which they've been involved in doing as well. In my role, I help organize an annual roadside conference. So this is open to the roadside vegetation managers around the state. It's held at different locations around the state because the roadside managers like to learn about what their colleagues are doing in other counties. So last year, it was in Decorah, Iowa at the Pivo Brewery Event Center, which is a really nice facility. We toured Shooting Stars Nursery. We have all sorts of talks related to roadside vegetation. But anyone's welcome to this, even though the core group tends to be Iowa County roadside managers. We do get other people from neighboring states sometimes, people from nonprofits, people just interested in, in learning more about roadside vegetation, networking with the people, the people who are out there doing this. They have a lot of practical on the ground experience if you wanna to talk to folks, that's a good place to do it. So this year it's gonna be in Okaboji in the Northwest corner of the state near the, the lakes, Okaboji Lakes, September 7th through 9th. If you wanna be on the mailing list to learn more about this, uh, just send me an email. I'll be sending out the, the save the date postcard pretty soon. And this year, we're also gonna have a session on getting a county roadside program started because the Northwest part of the state doesn't have that many active programs. So we're trying to, to reach out some of the neighboring counties and, and get them involved in thinking about getting a program started. So to conclude, this is my contact information. You're welcome to email me if you want those reports, which aren't part of the resources I provided for the technical. I provide the IRVM technical manual, I believe, but I don't believe I did the reports. If those aren't on there, you can email me. With that, I can answer any questions. Oh, great. Thanks, Christine. Yes, we have some questions. <laughs> okay. So I know I have been calling and emailing you about help to get a similar program up and running in Minnesota for all those Minnesotans that are out there watching today. Um, Highways for Habitats is the name of the program. And if you'd like to support and help us with it, um, you can get in touch with pollinatorfriendly.org. But the question is for you, Christine, are there other states you know of besides Minnesota that are trying to get programs up and running similar to Iowa's great roadside, living roadsides. So is this the focus along the state highways? No, the state IRVM? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. That is a state highway program to yeah. be clear. Sure. Other states that have this IRVM integrated roadside kind of approach are Texas, I would say Texas, North Carolina, Florida to some extent, Indiana, I think Kentucky is trying to do more and more, Illinois. Those are the ones that come to mind that I know they already have a program or they're transitioning to reducing their mowing, transitioning to using more natives or thinking about it. I think especially Illinois in the last few years, they've really taken off on trying to get more pollinator friendly practices along their roadsides and public education. And in your policy work, does it seem like there's more interested in uh, roadsides? Definitely. I think the growth of the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group really shows that. There's just more and more DOTs involved with that over the last 
it's almost seven years now since it's been started. Not only just for the, the pollinator benefit, but the cost savings, I think. The public interest, which is pretty widespread, I think, now they, there's so much awareness of pollinators, they're kind of pressuring DOTs to look into this more, or there's more acceptance if they do decide to reduce mowing, reduce herbicides. Sounds familiar. <laughs> um, okay, so here's one about actual management. So after um, impl uh, installing habitat by seeding, what are some good uh, strategies besides mowing? Besides mowing, hmm. I'm always really key in the first year to help reduce that weed competition with prairie plants. Prescribed burning is really good once the, the planting is established. So at the three, four year mark, a lot of the roadside managers like to burn the planting to help keep it healthy, to help reduce the woody vegetation from coming in. That's really important. They'll, if they don't burn, they'll spend a lot of time cutting brush, cutting little saplings out of the plantings. And I talk a lot about plantings because I know that's a big interest with this group and people interested in pollinators, but remember they're managing all the roadsides. So even the ones that they just have brome, they're not, they haven't been planted with something, they, they still need to cut back on the, on the woodies from coming in for safety. So that's something, as far as plantings, I would say burning is important. Strate strategic herbicide use, just going in and spring any weeds that are starting to come in. And the prairie plants are pretty good at out-competing those weeds. But I know the roadside managers in their experience, they'll know when it's appropriate to come in and, and take care of some that might be a little bit more of a problem, but they'll, they'll have more details about the exact, how they approach that. But yeah, burning spot herbicides, I would say that in addition to mowing. So over time, you have identified different seed mixes as more successful and less. And um, so can you talk a little bit about maybe what your favorite seed mix is in terms of um, not just appearance and management, but in resilience? I think the one I have now is just based on my predecessor, my, the previous program managers, what they've found helpful just based on feedback from the road same managers. So they let us know, well, this species, we hardly ever see it. So based on what, over almost 30 years of this program being around, I think we have a pretty good seed mix where we try to have a range of species adapted to both dry and wet conditions. Cause you know, within a, a, a ditch, you have dry all the way to really wet at the bottom. So you have to have a seed mix where something's gonna grow, where it all shakes out and there's something adapted to the really wet conditions or the dry conditions. And I believe that's one of the resources they provided was the seed mixes we've used last year, for example, if you just want to see what we've found helpful here in the county roadsides. So is there a place they can find those seed mixes? I think just the, the, the technical resources you wanted us to provide, the, the clean out and diversity mix for last year should be okay. in there, because that's a common okay. question. People like to see those. So that's on our um, summit website, which is yeah. pollinatorfriendly.org slash summit. And Christine uh, has some resources there in the technical manual. We'll have the seed mixes in it. So have you noticed any um, behaviors differently by wildlife since the habitat has been established? Do they tend to stay more within the habitat or do you see any problem safety issues that have increased, decreased? What have you witnessed? As far as the pollinators? Uh, animals, wildlife. Animals. We'd like to see more data on that. There's been some research showing there's really not much of an effect. The deer biologist I've talked to said, if you have tall vegetation in the roadside, if it's not that palatable, they're not gonna spend much time there. Deer tend to be more attracted to freshly mowed vegetation. They like that fresh, that cut vegetation. It's more nutritious. It's easier for them to eat. So just anecdotally, or the limited research that's been done, they're saying deer won't go to the roadside to eat, but they might bed down, maybe. But I mean, the roadsides aren't that wide near county roadsides, so I'm not sure why that'd be attractive if there's much traffic. So it's just, we don't have enough data as far as wildlife. That's an interesting point about deer, though. Yeah, maybe but, more bedding, but not, they shouldn't be eating those. Right. That's not the, their type of vegetation. 
Um, Christine, what about specific, specific uh, medium height native grasses for wet areas? There's a lot of wet areas in roadsides for erosion control. Um, do you have any grasses that you can recommend or plants in general? We really like prairie cord grass for the wetter areas. It's a nice, attractive grass that does well in the wet. Or sedges, we want to make sure we include plenty of sedges. And of course, erosion isn't as important in the low area anyway, so it's okay if there's a lot of the sedges end up growing there. But when we can't afford it, prairie cord grass can be pretty expensive, but when we can afford it, we certainly try to include some of that. Well, and it seems in general that um, habitat would help with erosion control. I mean, to what extent have you seen successes with that? Well, one of the, the roadside managers of the Pottawatomie County roadside manager where Council Bluffs is along the Missouri River. He was really happy with how his plantings did after the Missouri River floods, for example, when the, that's pretty extreme flooding that they've been having like was it two, three years ago when they had extreme flooding. So he, he sent me pictures saying, hey, here's what our roadside did. And so they had a roadside right by the river and then when the river receded, well, it was still intact. All you saw was the native grasses. There wasn't like pockets of soil missing. So anecdotally, that's just an example of how well these can perform even against the Missouri River, which is pretty strong force. That just seeing those pictures, that was pretty neat. Yeah, right. Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna throw one more question at you and then um, we'll, we'll move on. Um, do you have any recommendations for successful hydro seedings? Um, Apparently, they've gotten mixed results here. Oh, just like any seeding, I think good site preparation is important. As far as the details, we have that in our technical manual and just making sure the site is clear of weeds at the appropriate time of year, that you're using a heavy enough seeding rate. That's important, whether you're drilling or hydro seeding, but especially if you're hydro seeding, I think. Right, right, yeah probably under seeding or not enough seed is not a good tactic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's a balance. You wanna waste money on seed, but if you follow the recommended seeding rates, we've pretty, had pretty good success here. Is there a specific height that you found is, is good for erosion control? It's not so much the height, it's just the species we use in our root systems. So the, the big four, I mean, the big and little blue stem, Indian grass, Canada wild rice, another important one. Well, all those main native prairie grasses, they all have really good root systems for reducing erosion, really fibrous, especially big blue stem. It just has such a good root system. Well, Christine, I know you're a big proponent for getting our roadsides in shape for pollinators in the environment. So it, um, your email address is up on the summit website at pollinatorfriendly.org slash summit. And it, is it okay for them to send emails to you with more questions? Sure. Yeah, they're always welcome to send emails. That's great. Thanks so much for your talk today. Sure, um, thank you. We are